I set out to write a book about searching for impossibility. So actually, A Man in Search of the Perfect Taste was the first thing that came to me. The, hist the setting seemed inevitable. It seemed to me the last time that somebody would have the power and the money and the position to do this and live in a world where he didn't know precisely what he was gathering to himself. So it wasn't essentially history, it wasn't. It was the search for the perfect, it was literally the search for the perfect taste. I, want, I wanted to write something where none of the people in the book know what's going to happen. Everybody reading the book knows exactly what's going to happen. It gives, I mean, it gives an edge to the story because whatever, whatever happens, whatever happiness, whatever sadness, you know that the world is going to change massively beyond this certain point, and they don't. And I've always felt this reading pretty much anything written before a major event, so reading books written, actually written in the 30s before the Second World War, written in the 1910s before the First World War, or before the Russian Revolution, and you know that something massive is going to happen, and all those lives will change. And the person writing it doesn't know it, and obviously none of the people in the book know it. I think he has an incredibly happy life. I mean, I think what I wanted to do at the end was to have him able to look back on his life and be happy about what happened. No matter where he found himself, no matter what was going on around him, he was content and he wouldn't change it. And when he says, you know, at the end, that if he was going to do it all again, he would do it all again. He means it. Also, that little bit at the end where we touch on, you know, the two footnotes at the very end. Yeah. We touch on his son, who is now a friend of Napoleon, so you know that his son survives and goes on to greatness under Napoleon. And his daughter, you know, no, I think it's a good life. I think it's a good life. He's happy right at the beginning when he's sitting with his back to the dung heap and he's eating beetles as they scuttle across the cobbles in his father's courtyard. He's happy because he's sitting by himself. It's sunny. He's allowed to eat precisely what he wants. And he's, until this point, being left in peace. And also as an old man looking back on that point, he knows that his real life is just about to begin. And so that's the happiness. Um, as a small child, we had a cookery book that began with Aardvark and ended with Zebra. And when you're tiny and it's a wonderful book, you look at it and it tells you how to eat water buffalo, how to cook elephant, how to, you know, do sturgeon, whatever. And I've cooked recipes from it. I mean, not those obviously, but it's a great book and I've cooked recipes from it. Some of the recipes are developed and changed. There are recipes for heart pickle. I've never found one for wolf heart pickle. So I just took a recipe for something else heart pickle and adapted it to wolf. But and the, the, the condom, it's, it's... That's real. That's how you make it. That is real. <laughs> I got... One of the wonderful things about this is there is somebody who knows this stuff. There is somebody who knows how you cooked in that period, how you heated a salamander, which was a huge steel plate, and you held it over the top of something like a modern grill, and it just, you know, baked the top, grilled the top. You want to know how to make a condom, a 17th century condom? There is a historian out there. There are several historians out there who know precisely how to make it, down to scraping membrane and holding the membrane over sulfur. So I just emailed a couple of people and said, if I was going to do this, how would I do this? And got back fairly detailed instructions on, you know, we think it's done like this. Some people say it's done like that. You know, there were a couple of ways to do this. And I just used that. I read Candide. I mean, the only book I read for this, I drew on knowledge that I had, but the book I went back and I read was Candide. So yes, it's meant to sound as it, it's meant to sound very slightly as if it's a French book. You just happen to be reading in English. I think this is a deeply moral tale. I think Jean Marie is a deeply moral person, but it's not necessarily any morality you would recognize. He's also not a glutton. He may be surrounded by people who are stuffing their faces and not tasting the food they eat, but Jean Marie is very, very precise about what he eats and on the whole, eats in really quite small amounts, but across a very, very wide spectrum. 
have three novels set in North Africa that were detective novels in an Ottoman, an alternative Ottoman Empire. And there was quite an element of research for that. But the approach to writing was different. I had a very strong image of Jean-Marie with his back to the Dung Hill, and I just sat down and I just wrote it and broke lots of rules that you're not meant to break when you write. So switching tenses, foreshadowing, basically that. I, mean, I wrote this book quite a lot for myself. It was a book I had wanted to write for a very long time. And there's a certain, uh, no, I was about to say there's a certain freedom. There's a huge freedom in simply sitting down and writing something because you want to write it.